Hi everybody, the following show was recorded live, warts and all, no editing whatsoever. Whatever happened, you will see. This is one of my theatre shows called Unexpected Tales. Part one is about 40 minutes, part two will come soon. That's about 50 minutes. It's live, it's unscripted, nobody knows what's going to happen, but you will in a few minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to subscribe, get in touch, follow me, like my videos, make a comment, and I hope to see you soon. Cheerio. Thank you very much indeed. And unexpected. It's unexpected because I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> Not at all. But let me just explain the longer first of all. Because how many times do you go to theatre when the performer is actually drinking alcohol? <laughs> it's not normally a very good sign, I assure you. However, it's become part of what I now do. Because about three weeks ago, I got this gig over at Lonely Castle in Durham. Do you know Lonely Castle? Yes. Very, you don't know, it's very important. Very medieval, you feel like you're going back in time. It's fabulous. And I got booked to do this auction for a very posh organisation. So I was on my way to Durham, eating brain food. Because I'm determined that if I don't eat bananas and nuts, my brain doesn't function. And I've got to tell you, I've had no bananas or nuts tonight. <laughs> so it's all going to go terribly. En route to Durham, I was driving up, eating some nuts. And I bit into a nut, and I, my teeth slipped, and I bit my tongue. Do you know that feeling? Yes. Oh my God, I got to Lumley Castle. I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol. That's my agent saying, do not tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never work again. And I got to Lumley Castle, and I promise you, my tongue felt like it's hanging out of my mouth. And I was slavering. I was talking to the organisers, and they thought I'd been drinking all day long. Like, I was slavering. I looked like a crazy person. My tongue was on fire, and somebody said, look, try some lager. So I sat down in a little porter's chair. Now, if, you, if you know what a porter's chair is, it's like a, a Georgian wing-back chair with a hood on it. So you can't hide in it. So I was hiding in this porter's chair, swilling lager around my mouth and dipping my tongue into the lager. When this rather elegant lady walked by with a tiara and a ball gown, looked at me and went, oh my God. <laughs> that is not a very good start, is it? Anyway, it numbed the pain. And I quite like the little kind of sensation it gave to my brain. So now I allow myself one pint of lager. So in the break, when you see me ordering another pint of lager, Adam, please tell me to stop, would you? Right, okay, thank you. But it is fabulous to be in Helmsley. Is Helmsley just the nicest market town on the planet? Yes! It is! Yes. I mean, I say that wherever I go, obviously. <laughs> I actually genuinely believe it. I mean it. I do. I, the Feathers Pub, just around the corner there, I celebrated my 21st birthday there. Seven years ago, sir, that was. Yes! And we see TV ages you dramatically, right? <laughs> no, I love Helmsley. And, and what I love about Helmsley, I think it suits me. It's kind of, it's refined. <laughs> it's dripping in style, isn't it? I mean, look at you. Look at that brown suit, circa 1975. You are so ready. You are bang on trend, I'm telling you. That is fantastic. It's wonderful, and it reminds me very much of the place I was born. Because I was born in North Yorkshire. I'm proud to say I am a Yorkshire. I was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Surprises, you're good. Oh, yeah. I, I said that in Maidenhead, you might have got a boom. <laughs> Forgetting where I am. When I'm in Yorkshire, it's fine to glorify Yorkshire, but yes, born in Yorkshire. And it just reminds me of this little place I was born, the countryside, the properties, the sophisticated people. Have <laughs> <laughs> we got someone from York or something? Yeah, yeah. York. <laughs> yeah, so, so I feel absolute home here. I've got to tell you, though, and I'm not here to be modest, right? I've got to tell you, the little place I was born. It's even more market than Helmsley. Oh. Posher than Helmsley, more sought after, more tourists. It's a little town, you might have heard of it, called Middlesbrough. <laughs> Anybody else from Middlesbrough here? Oh, 
all we have. Check your wallet. See the side of that man. <laughs> <laughs> Middlesbrough. It was in North Yorkshire when I was born. 1967, Madam. The summer of love. You're too young to remember that, sir. But apparently, it was wild. Yes. Anyway, so it's back in North Yorkshire again now. The reason I'm here tonight, the reason you're here tonight, of course, is because of the power of television. Mm. Television is remarkably powerful, but have you ever wondered how on earth people get into TV? You're wondering how the hell did he get into TV? That's what you're wondering. You know, I can see. I can see. I can read minds. Have you ever wondered? Well, I have. And I've met many people in TV, and I always ask them, how did they get into TV? And I'm going to give you two examples of people that you might know. Paul Martin. From yeah. Flogging. Do you know Paul? Yeah. My mates, yes? Yeah? Yeah. Lovely guy. Paul Martin, and I'm not bitter, but yeah, I'm really not. Paul Martin <laughs> had this antique shop in Bristol. BBC Bristol are literally around the corner. They come up with this idea called Flog It, and someone in the production says, do we know anybody in the antiques trade? And the guy says, yes, my mate Paul's got a shop around the corner. Well, take a camera around, go and see what he, what he thinks about this show idea, run it in his face, Get him to say a few words and let's pitch the idea to the big boys in London. They did that. The big boys in London loved the idea of flogging. Paul Martin, within three weeks, is on TV. Not bitter in any way whatsoever. Right? Get this. Another one. Now, you'll all be too young to remember this character. Do you remember, madam? Percy Thrower. Yes. You do? Yes. My God. You're all incredibly young in that. It must be the author. It's got to be. Percy Thrower, get this, had a job in a garden centre. He was behind the potting shed and he was trimming a bush. Yes, he was quite a womaniser, but never mind. He was trimming a bush, right? And this is the truth. A BBC director was walking through the garden centre. It was quite a tall bush, this, and he had a ladder. He was looking up. And he said to Percy Thrower, what are you doing? Percy Thrower turned round, he tripped, landed, on top of the BBC director. I kid you not. Within four weeks, Percy throwers on television. Not bitter in any way whatsoever. Now me, how long do you think it took me to get into television? Three weeks. Three weeks? You've got more confidence than uh, I thought. Three weeks, I'll tell you what happened. 20 years ago, it didn't take me 20 years, I'm not that old. 20 years ago, 1999, I had a shop in Barnard Castle. Do you know Barnard Castle? Yes. yes. Lovely little town. I, live, I still live there now. Bose Museum. Now, luckily for me, I've been working with the curator of Bose Museum, researching a painting that I thought was of Emma Hamilton by George Reynolds. I thought I was in the money. I wasn't. It was a fake. Right? That's just a story of my life, okay? Never mind. I've been working with the museum. Well, the museum got a call from Radio Tees asking if they could recommend an antiques dealer from Barnum Castle to chat on the radio the following day, live broadcast from Barnum Castle. So Radio Tees ring me. Hello, David, it's Radio Tees. Bit of a shock to me, don't know anybody in the media. Hello, how can I help you? Uh, we've got a live broadcast tomorrow, and you've been recommended by the Bose Museum. Would you like to chat with us on the radio, take some calls? And every single fibre of my body screamed, no. I don't want to do that. So, if I said to you now I have a microphone, I'm going to ram it in your face, you're going to talk to 80,000 people live, what would you say? No. no. Exactly. I'm so pleased you said that because you'd ruin my story if you said yes. Anyway. I screamed no, but something inside me was shouting yes. And I just said, yes, I'll do it. So I went home that night. I didn't sleep. The first time in my whole life I never slept a week. I was so petrified and mortified, <laughs> regretting what I'd done. I didn't eat. I walked up to the studio the following day, set up in the local newspaper office, and I felt like my legs had been chopped off from the knees. I lost sensation. I felt like I was this tall walking up the hill, <laughs> as if I was like a condemned man. I was introduced to the presenter and the researcher, and we walked into this little room where they had their studio. And the first thing that struck me was this, that these people were just normal. A bit like you, sir. Not so much like you, but still. They were just normal people. Blew my mind. They were chatting, playing a record, and they said, right, we're going to go live. Headphones on, David. 
let's talk. And I just started talking. And what seemed to be like two minutes went like that. They said goodbye. I left the studio and I thought, well, I must have been rubbish because after two minutes, they kicked me off. I checked my watch. It was 20 minutes. I loved it. You know why I loved it, sir? Because I loved the sound of my own voice. <laughs> Now, I made the mistake of telling Christina Trevanion this year, didn't you, Christina Trevanion? Yes. We were doing an event together, and I said to Christina Trevanion about this, I love the sound of my own voice. I was making a joke of it. The following day, she introduces me onto the stage, and she says, and welcome David Harper. By the way, he loves the sound of his own voice. And the audience went, hmm. I know. Even worse than tonight, seriously. <coughs> anyway, so I wrote him, I said, I want to do that thing. They said, you can. So I started doing radio. Every single week, Radio York, Newcastle, Tees, even in the south of England, down the line, I, it's the end line. I loved it. Every single week. Now, bear in mind, I was on the radio for an hour. I had to get to some of the stations. So you, it would take a day, really, to turn it around. But how much do you think so? The BBC were paying me on an hourly basis. <laughs> Go on, be careful. Slightly above minimum wage. <laughs> he rates me highly, doesn't he? Yeah. What do you reckon? When was it? 1999. We're not in shillings and... Uh, <laughs> these, you know. yeah. Take your time, we've got till Tuesday for God's sake. Yeah. I didn't ask you. Yeah. And, oh my God, after all that! Ruins it! A thousand... I should have been on a thousand pounds. You're more, you're closer, sir. You said five pounds an hour. I was earning zero. Absolutely nothing. BBC budgets, even back then, were even worse now. You have to pay them to go on radio. Absolutely nothing. I did that for four years. Four years. Not four weeks, four years. Thinking that maybe TV might just come knocking, because I thought that's where the money is in TV. How wrong was I? Right? Anyway, so then I started valuing behind the scenes and writing articles for magazines, and I started following for a show called Cash in the Attic. It was brand new, about 20 years ago, do you remember that? I was behind the scenes, not on the camera, travelling around the countryside, earning, how much do you think, madam? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you rate me as much as the BBC, don't you? <laughs> yes. Absolutely nothing. But I kept thinking that TV might come along. It's funny enough, Cash in the Attic, I did actually make it off Cash in the Attic much later on. Two months later, they decommissioned it. <laughs> Just a coincidence, I'm quite sure. But anyway, what happened again, another phone call came out of the blue. And this fellow, I'll never forget it, he said to me, Hello David, you don't know me, but I know you, so what you got to me. And he said, My name is Bernard Periotampe. Well, oh, hello Bernard, he said, Hello darling. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Sir, so, have you ever been called darling by a man before? <laughs> well you have now, darling. <laughs> hey, hey, how's it feel? <laughs> Tell the truth. It feels all right, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. You'll be thinking about this at three o'clock in the morning, but oh my God, what is happening to my life? After all these years, darling, he said, I know you. Right, okay, that's great. He said, would you like to put yourself in for a Channel 4 show? I said, I would. Channel 4 looking for a new presenter. We're going to come up tomorrow, if you're up for it, I'm going to put a camera on you, tell us about you. I said, great. Now, every being of my body, after all of these years, was screaming, I want this. The following day, a director turned up at my shop, covering my face, talk about yourself. Now, of course, did I love that a lot, eh? <laughs> my God, he couldn't get out of there quick enough. No, wait, I haven't finished yet. Well, yet the age of three, right? I was talking the hind leg of the jumped back in his car, off to London. Following day, Bernard Perry rings me. Darling. You're getting to like this, I know you are. Darling! We love you. We want to put you in to channel what we think you're perfect. But before we do that, we want to come back again and do another screen test with you. So we're going to come back in a week's time, David, darling, he said. But, and in the meantime, I'd like you to make one or two alterations to your appearance. <laughs> I know! Can you believe it, madam? I looked even better than this then! Make it, I went, okay, what would you like me to do? Now at the time, I had kind of bouffant hair, a bit like yours, that's bouffant, right? But it was thinning, but I was trying to disguise it. 
Now, ladies, you'll know what I was doing. I was scrunch drying it and hairspraying it. I was about four inches taller in those days, right? <laughs> Up here. Now, what I didn't realise, when you stand under light, you can see right through the hair. Now, Bernard had spotted this and he didn't like it. He said, shave your hair off. I had a beard, shave your beard off. Smart yourself up a bit. He said, I couldn't believe it. Smart yourself up a bit. And he said, David, you're very pale. Put some false tan on. And by the way, your eyebrows, he said, they're a bit ginger. Now, that wasn't racist. <laughs> he, said, he said, they're a bit ginger. I want you to pluck them and dye them nice and dark. So suntan, shave, no beard. Black eyebrows looking red hot. I said, okay, I'll do it. Had a week to do it. Now, gents, have you ever put false tan on? Seriously? Have, admit it. Come on. No. Oh, not from Elmsley. Oh, we wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you will be, darling, within about two days, I promise you. <laughs> well, they say you're supposed to put it on over a period of time, like over several days to build up. Well, I tried that. My wife was advising me very badly. I wasn't turning brown, right? And with the black eye stuff, you meant to put it on and leave it on for like eight minutes. That does nothing. I wasn't getting wet. And by the way, gents, do not, uh, even you, you, do not pluck those eyebrows. They're crackers, right? Don't, because it is so painful. They say it's worse than childbirth. Do you know that? <laughs> I was crying my eyes out, plucking my eyebrows. Anyway, what happened? I got to the Saturday. I was doing an antique show there on the Sunday, and the director was coming back on the Monday. I wasn't getting anywhere, so I went to bed Saturday night, covered in false tan, <laughs> covered in black eyebrow dye, had some rashes where they, you know, I've been plucking everything, still painful, taking paracetamols, you've got to do it, honestly, it's terrible. I don't know how women cope, I don't, right? The following morning, I woke up like a monstrosity, right? I made David Dickinson look like a ghost. <laughs> I wasn't just brown, I was orange stroke brown, and I had these two black slugs across my eyebrows. I, nothing would move it. I thought, oh my God. I scrubbed myself, nothing happened. I went to Harrogate, I was doing 96, but in Harrogate. Harrogate, the most conservative town in the United Kingdom. I turned up, can you imagine what I looked like? My wife said I look like a confused transvestite. <laughs> and I thought, that's very unkind. Very much, I was trying to build my confidence for the next day. So I'm doing this antiques fair, and he also got me to wear some glasses. Now, in those days, I only wore glasses for driving. So he wanted me to look kind of intellectual. Apparently, you should try. So I put some glasses on, makes you look even better. <laughs> and, but you see, because I was wearing them for driving, I was at Harrogate. And I didn't need them for like just general looking around like this. And so what happened, again, it felt like I'd kind of shrunk if you've ever done that. And so not only did I look like a confused transvestite, but I was walking like this around like that. I'm going to bump into something. So I looked completely crazy. Following day, up comes the director. After all these years, maybe now, <coughs> I do the same thing. Bernard Perry rings me two days later. Darling, he says, we love you. Channel 4 love you. They want you to present natural born dealers. I was elated. We're going to start filming at four to six weeks. In the meantime, David, can I make one or two suggestions for your appearance? <laughs> yes, I went, oh, yes, okay. He said, throw the beard back, okay. Dump the false tan, and for God's sake, don't touch your eyebrows, right? Put the glasses on. And put a jacket on and smarten yourself up. I went, thank you very much. She said, darling, by the way, just so you know, TV puts 10 years and 10 pounds on you. Lose a bit of weight in the next four weeks, will you? <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that is how tonight I end up here at the Helmsley Blinken Art Centre. That's it! Made it. This is almost the, the first, this is my ninth show of this, this is my first theatre show, and tonight it's about sold out. So this I'm absolutely delighted. Never mind these blank spaces, they just couldn't get up Sutton Bank, right? Because I get up Sutton Bank. Did anybody else not get up Sutton Bank? I know, I was panicking. Those floods, tornadoes, elephants, and everything barely get here. But tonight's show is unexpected because. I don't know what questions you're going to ask, so I want you to ask questions. You can ask anything. We can talk about anything. 
We can talk about personal problems, my little <laughs> Seriously, with a guy wearing a 1975 suit, you've got some problems, right? We, we're all friends here tonight, we can share, right? Anything. You want to know about Tim Wanakop? Is he having an affair with Anita Manning? You just ask me. Right? Come on. Can you imagine that look? Seriously? Talk about Halloween, that is seriously. Yeah. So do we have any questions, whatever you like? Put me on the spot. Yes, sir. Will you ever be, uh, be as good as Paul Laidlaw? Well, oh. <laughs> and when you say that, you looked at your wife. What do you mean? He's good. He always makes money. He does. Yeah. He's on the antiques road. Yeah. Paul Laidlaw. He nearly always wins. Paul Laidlaw is a master. There's no doubt about it. And he's a great friend of mine. And we did an antiques road trip together. And I've got to say, he's a lovely guy. He loves his military. Yet say again. Like a lot of fun we time. did. We laughed all the time. He's a great guy, Paul. And they're all great. In fact, we've got his Ellis's in the room tonight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> Angus Ashwood. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know that mental mayor from Kirby Stephen? He's a bit into like arms and armour. He's a bit like Paul Laidlaw. Thank God they're both not in the same room at the same time. Right? <laughs> Welcome, Angus. Give Angus a round of applause. But Paul is a great guy, and he, and he, and he really, he's quite studious, and he, he describes himself as a geek, and he is a geek when it comes to military, because that's what he absolutely loves. Um, and, and, and he's just, he's very good and very professional. And everybody you work with is distinctly different. I mean, there's a big difference between Paul Laidlaw and Philip Sowell. You know Philip Sowell with his scarf, yes? Yeah? Both massive characters, great characters. And I, I did a talk the other day in Newcastle, and a lady said to me, Philip Sowell, does he ever take his scarf? <laughs> have you seen the scarf? I have filmed in Paris in August with Philip Sowell, and his head is so bright red because of this woolly scarf. I kept thinking it was going to pop off. I seriously did. He will not remove that scarf. And I said, he never takes his scarf off. And rumour has it, he sleeps in the moon. <laughs> with his scarf on. <laughs> And the lady said to me, he sleeps in the nude with his scarf on. I said, he does. She said, give him my number. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, the thought of Philip Serrell looking attractive naked with a scarf on, chaps, there is hope for all. <laughs> is there not? <laughs> so they're all lively. Yes, and Paul Laidlaw, I think he, he has the record. He's, he bought a camera, I think, for about 80 quid, sold for £20,000. So he's a master. I love him to bits. He's, he's a great guy. I mean, they're, they're all great, and you can't really say, talk about the ones that are tricky to, I mean, that would be very unprofessional, I mean, Mark Stacey, that would be very unprofessional. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, right? It would be unkind. <laughs> Do you know what you get for asking a question? You get Go some... <laughs> no, you've got to stay all week, I'm here all week, yeah. <laughs> you get something special. Did you know that I'm an artist? Yes. A painter? Not that kind of artist, madam. Don't be so rude, right? <laughs> and I particularly love painting cars, because cars are a fundamental part of what I do. I've been around classic cars since I was, I could remember. My dad had E-types, Austin Healy's, we love cars as a family, so I paint cars. And I brought three sample pictures of my cars, and I look at you, sir, and I see you as a V8 Camaro. Give him a round of applause, he gets a V8 Camaro. There you go. Well done. Well done, yes. That, he said, if you get me to sign that, right, seriously, when my wife kills me, which she will, at some point, that'll be worth a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes. Yes, what, sorry, I've got this man on the back there. When did you first get into antiques and what's your speciality in the antique? My first time, my passion for antiques starts <coughs> when I'm five years old. Hunting in farmers' fields in North Yorkshire. So I love history. And I go searching in farmers' fields looking for treasure. I still think of myself today as a treasure hunter. Not an antique stealer or antique expert, but a treasure hunter. And I just go around these fields after the farmer had piled it and look at the bits of broken pottery. And what I found was treasure. Totally worthless. But nevertheless, magnificent. Little clay pipes. Sections of tobacco pipes that farmers were smoking between the 17th 
19th century, used to blow my mind that I was there at that very moment that that little bit of clay pipe came up to the surface. And I have a box at home full of clay pipes, bits of blue and white pottery, worth nothing, but I could never, ever sell them. But it's the connection to people long gone that blows my mind. And it's the stories behind these things. So even at the age of five, six, and seven, I was reading about pipe manufacturing during the 70s. I know it's so very boring. I should have been out playing with guns and arrows. I was reading about clay pipe manufacturers, right? I love history, and I've always believed the closest you will ever get to traveling through time is holding an object from the past. Mm -hmm. Something that has barely <coughs> changed in, say, 200 years is a connection to real people long gone. Mm -hmm. And that is my, so that, that was my interest. And then as I got older, I kept re researching and studying. Then when I was about 13 or 14, we lived in Africa. And my mum, because my mum loves antiques, did then always bought themselves a little bit, still does, she bought a chaise long, a chaise long that reputedly once belonged to Lord Nelson. It's in deepest, darkest Africa. Can you believe that? The stories you get told in this business, right? Anyway, she believed it. Apparently this chaise had been shipped out a hundred years prior and it came with a written letter of provenance. This once belonged to Lord Nelson. Well, when it was delivered to our home, we all as a family stood back we couldn't believe our eyes. Lord Nelson had sat on that chaise, and I'm thinking, Emma Hamilton. Have you seen pictures of Emma Hamilton? <laughs> she was hot totty from the 18th century, right? I loved Emma Hamilton. So the thought of Lord Nelson and Emma Hamilton on my chaise was amazing. We were all so impressed. Mum was so chuffed that she'd bought this thing. Anyway, at school, in the library, there was a book on old English furniture. So I brought the book home, and I studied the book, and I studied the chaise, and I loved it. I crawled under the chaise with a torch and looked at its construction, the kind of springing, the nails that were used, the tacks, the shapes of the heads, the shape of the leg, the wood, the casters, the white porcelain casters. And I dated that chaise very accurately and I loved doing it. So the researching and development of that information was fabulous. And I dated that chaise the 25 years after the death of Lord Nelson. <laughs> so, the chances of Lord Nelson and Emma Hamilton ever sitting on that chaise were pretty remote by them, weren't they, right? Now, I told my mum that she was furious. <laughs> she went looking for this antiques dealer. He'd put her back to London, right? He'd left the country. So now she's left with this chaise. So that didn't bother me. What blew my mind was the story. And the fact that I dated it to the 1830s, early 1940s, it was mind-boggling. And then, when we eventually came back to England, this chaise, with other things, was shipped back from Africa and sold in auction. And even taking into account the shipping costs, Lord Nelson's chaise made money. <laughs> so at that point, I thought, hang on a minute. This is a business opportunity, not just a hobby. I can actually make money out of these things. So from the age of 18, that's what I've been doing. Not necessarily successfully, but never mind. I enjoy doing it. Thank you very much, Madam. You get a car. Now, I'm looking at you. Give her a round of applause for a good question. <laughs> Would you like to be a Morris Traveller? <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, then. How about this is you, an AC Cobra V8? <laughs> oh, yes, Madam. Oh, is that your husband? Yeah. By God, you're in for a good night tonight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well done. But actually, talking about AC Cobras, I had an experience with an AC Cobra Ooh. when filming Antique Fellowship. Well, I did. Because, you know, they say that you should never work with children and animals, don't they, in TV? Well, I'm going to include children, animals, classic cars, and celebrities. <laughs> Try and avoid celebrities if you can. I did an Antiques road trip in an AC Cobra with one particular celebrity who almost got me arrested. <laughs> now, if I give you the name, you'll understand everything. This celebrity is called John Barrowman. <laughs> <laughs> you know John Barrowman. Yes. John Barrowman is talent on legs. He can do everything. 
He sings, he dances, he presents, he acts, he trapeze artists, he's really good looking, and I hate him with everything. <laughs> Don't you? Exactly. He is a wonder, right, seriously. And he has won so many awards, it's unbelievable. But when we met him on the Antiques Road Trip, John had just won a very special award. An award he was so pleased with, it was unbelievable. John Barrowman, the night before, had just won Rear of the Year. <laughs> That's what he had won. John Barrowman, Rear of the Year. And he was so pleased about it, he couldn't stop talking. Not only talking about it, showing it. So getting into cars was like this. He was walking like that. Rear of the Year kept slapping his backside. Now, at the beginning, it was, it was funny. Come 12 o'clock about lunchtime, we're fed up of this John Barrowman with his rear of the earth. End of the day, we think, come on, the next day he can't be talking about it. Following day, he pitches up in a pair of white, skimpy shorts. So skimpy, you couldn't believe it. He could barely walk like this. But he loved it. End of that day, we're demented. Day three, he turns up in kind of, you know, those gangster pants. You know when you were in prison, did you wear those gangster pants? <laughs> Down like that. Did you? Did you? Love slow. He turned up with a pair of them. Slow slum, halfway down here, luckily he was wearing underpants. Not much of them, I can tell you, right? But they were there, thank God. And this, ladies and gents, was a Sunday morning in Swansea at an antique centre in the summertime at 7am. They opened up especially early for us. Loads of plate glass windows, lots of sunshine, lots of reflections. So we had the AC Cobra. Two film crews, John Barrowman with his gangster pants on, us and Mylene Class. <laughs> oh yes sir, I can see you with a check shirt. You're just waking up now because I said Mylene Class. I hope you've enjoyed your snooze by the way, that's great. Yeah. Mylene Class, she should have won rear of the that's never mind. I told her she slapped me. I thought that was a bit unfair. Anyway, Mylene Class, picture the scene. But picture this, John Barrowman in the plate glass windows was doing this. Ooh, ooh, baby! Like this, rear of the year, rear of the year, right? Mucking about like this. Now, we didn't know that there was CCTV there around this area, and a CCTV operator at 7 a.m. on a Sunday with nothing else to do but watch us. He called the police, <laughs> right? Bearing in mind we've got a pink convertible VW and the AC Cobra film crews, he thought we were making a porn movie. <laughs> That's what he thought. He rang the police with John Barrowman with his pants half down. Well, I'm not kidding you. We hear a wait, wait. You've heard that before, haven't you? Well, you will now at the Darling Room. You'll be out in where is it? Yeah, York. That's where you go. Wait, wait. We turned round. There was this police car with the lights flashing. Two burly policemen get out in a very angry mood. They would rather be in McDonald's at seven o'clock in the morning, wouldn't they? Right? Not stopping a porn manufacturer movie. Right. Anyway, so we get out. What's going on here? Nice, I, I speak, well, we're filming. Yeah, we can see that. What are you filming? We've had a report of lewd behaviour, right, from CCTV <laughs> operator. So I try to explain and calm them down. It's the antiques road trip. Oh, yeah, right, got cars. I said, we've got Mylene Class. Mylene Class? Where's Mylene Class? I pointed out Mylene Class. Really, that's her? Yes, it's Mylene Class and John Barrowman. You've got John Barrowman? Yes, John, Mylene, come on over. The policemen, suddenly their demure changed altogether. They were looking for a scrap when they arrived. Suddenly they were all like, oh, 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 all like this. And in no time, they're doing selfies with John Barrowman going, rear of the earth, rear of the earth. <laughs> Get that. Had it not been John Barrowman, they definitely would have arrested us for lewd behaviour and porn films. No. <laughs> So you should never work with those people, celebrities and classic cars, but I did, you learn something from everybody you meet, don't you? You really do. I always think you do. In fact, someone said to me many years ago, as a young man, he said, you'll meet lots of people in life, David. When you meet somebody, if you like something about their character, mannerism, he said, steal it. Seriously, just take it and inherit it. So this is a product of 500 crazy people I've met in my life. Right? <laughs> anyway, so John Barrowman taught me something that I'll never forget, and I'm now going to teach you it, and you will never forget it, and this will change your lives forever. I'm going to teach you how to have a Hollywood smile. <laughs>
<laughs> a Hollywood smile. John Barrowman has it. He showed me dozens of photos on his phone, and I'm serious. He said, David, I'm a teacher of the Hollywood smile. Look. And he went through his pictures of him in different locations with exactly the same smile. So you know the idea, Christmas parties, people say smile and you grin it, don't you? Then you see the pictures and oh my God, what am I doing? I look crazy. This is how you nail the perfect smile. You ideally need a mirror. So when you go home tonight after this show, I guarantee you, you will all be not brushing your teeth but going, <laughs> you will, you'll do it and then you'll remember this, you will. So this is how you get it. This is how you practice your Hollywood smile. You've got to pretend that you have an apple in your hand. And then you've got to, as if you're going to bite the apple, so you took a big bite. Go on, man, let's use you. Go on, big bite. That's it, perfect. Hold it, hold it there. You open your mouth wide, take the apple away, then close your teeth, then you put your tongue to the back of your front teeth and hold it. Do it, sir. Do it for us. Oh my God, Hollywood is calling. What can I do? That's it. You will all be practicing. Pretend you're biting the apple. Hold it. The crucial thing is tongue behind your back teeth to nail it. Sticks. Yeah. <laughs> your wife might knock your teeth out if you continue like that. So, guaranteed, you, tomorrow you'll all be walking around healthy going, <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> Brilliant. Was that from a question or did I just rub it on then? Do I give anybody a card? Yes. Who do I give a card? Me. Right, madam, what do you want? Oh, I've given you a card already. <laughs> do you want another one? <laughs> do we have another question? Yes. Yes, sir. Go on. What do you think, in your experience, uh, contributes toward the decline in prices of certain items and then the rise again? For example, we have a grandfather clock, 1800. Oh. Oh, good luck with that one. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Uh, pence, but when will it, what do you think will trigger the rise again of, of, of that item, but others as well? And yeah. Decline? Okay, so the question is, you know, antiques of ebb and flow, values ebb and flow, like any other business. And at the moment, what they refer to as brown furniture, which is an unfortunate term, you know, <clears throat> classic 18th and 19th century, particularly British cabinet furniture, has imploded on itself. And I can tell you, in 1996, it was a different world. I had an antique shop, too, in actual fact, and I was selling mainly furniture. Before I tell this story, can I just ask, did I ever sell a piece of furniture to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so, in 1996, was true. No, I can continue with the story. Right. Right. What happened in 1996 was a report came out called the Mars Bar Index. And it tracked values of objects from 1966 to 1996, the 30-year period, including the Mars bar. So the Mars bar cost so many pence in 66 compared to 96. And they tracked the value of objects, classic cars, properties, and antiques and stocks and shares. Antique furniture outperformed stocks and shares and property in 1996. So I had this report. I duplicated this report so many times, it was unbelievable. I was selling classic 18th and 19th century furniture like hotcakes and for big money. And I was waving this report around saying, look, here is the proof. If you pay four and a half thousand pounds for your grandfather bought, which you would have done in 1996, it is money in the bank, ladies and gentlemen. And I was so confident on the bottom of every single one of my receipts I put. Due to the ever-increasing difficulty in finding good antique furniture, I will offer you the following. Oh. Are you sure I haven't sold anything to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't tell this story to anyone. I will offer you the following. If at any time you want to dispose of an antique purchase from me, I will either A, give you your money back, <laughs> or B, give you at least your purchase price in part exchange against another item. So I was selling antique furniture like nothing on earth. It was a great time. And then come about the late 1990s, about the time I find myself on radio, it for some reason collapses. So I did a runner to America for a couple of years, trying to get away from all my clients, and I came back. And it still hasn't improved, and it hasn't improved since the early 2000s. And I thought that the furniture market would pick up, and it hasn't yet. 
it's still languishing. Your four and a half grand grandfather clock might be, if you're very lucky, worth a grand. It might be worth 500 quid. And I'm sorry, darling, I really am, honestly, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but things will change eventually. But right now, the market is for modern art, you know, modern paintings. Have a look at my website, you can buy them there, don't worry about that. Um, and mid-century stuff, 1950s, 60s stuff, stuff that I was throwing away in the 1990s. I was chucking it away. And that's why that stuff is actually quite valuable, because people have said to me so many times over the years, I can't believe they uh, my grandfather in the 1950s used to throw away brown furniture. And I would always say, Excellent news. I'm really pleased about that because if everything that was ever manufactured was still in circulation today, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't have TV programs, it's because things get thrown away. So the stuff I was throwing away in the 1990s is now worth a good money. So mid-century stuff, modern art, and it mixes really well, modern pottery, that kind of thing. But your classic Georgian and Victorian pieces are magnificent value. I've got a little holiday flat in Barnard Castle, which I'm now renting out, by the way. It's ruthless marketing, I know, but if you fancy a weekend in Barnet, it is furnished with nothing but my paintings and period furniture. And I can tell you, I bought two George III, circa 1770, mahogany chests of drawers, one with a brushing slide. Something, the one with a brushing slide, I would sold for 2,000 pounds 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I paid 130 pounds each for Absolutely, but it makes the place look the business, but furnished on the cheap. So, look, it'll come back, right? You might have to wait, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Like that. <laughs> You'll probably get your money back then. But a good question, round of applause. And you know what you're going to get, don't you? You're going to get a Morris Traveller. <laughs> Because you'll never be able to sell your long case grandfather clock, but you can transport it around with it. There you go, round of applause again. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, it's now break time, right? But when you come back, I have a very special something for you. And by the way, you will be coming back because the doors are locked. Right? <laughs> I can't leave, so you might as well come, go and get a drink and come back. But when you do come back, I'm going to test your knowledge. I'm going to ask you a couple of antique-related questions, and the correct answerer will win a prize. Second prize will be a trip to the Yorkshire Wildlife Park for two adults. No children. Right? No children alive. I know it's a wildlife park, but damn them, two adults. Day pass. Second prize. First prize will be two tickets. Get this, two tickets to any one of my future shows. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first prize, so it's drinky time, and I'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you very much.